Specialist by Robert Sheckley. The photon storm struck without warning, pouncing upon the ship from behind a bank of giant red stars. I barely had time to flash a last second warning through Talker before it was upon them. It was Talker's third journey into deep space in his first light pressure storm. He felt a sudden pang of fear as the ship yawed violently, caught the force of the wave front and careened end for end. Then the fear was gone, replaced by a strong pulse of excitement. Why should he be afraid, he asked himself. Hadn't he been trained for just this sort of emergency? He had been talking to Feeder when the storm hit, but he cut off the conversation abruptly. He hoped Feeder would be all right. It was the youngster's first deep space trip. The wire-like filaments that made up most of Talker's body were extended throughout the ship. Quickly, he withdrew all except the ones linking him to eye, engine, and the walls. This was strictly their job now. The rest of the crew would have to shift for themselves until the storm was over. I had flattened his disc-like body against a wall and had one seeing organ extended outside the ship. For greater concentration, the rest of his seeing organs were collapsed, clustered against his body. Through Eye's seeing organ, Talker watched the storm. He translated Eye's purely visual image into a direction for Engine, who shoved the ship around to meet the waves. At appreciably the same time, Talker translated direction into velocity for the walls, who stiffened to meet the shocks. The coordination was swift and sure, I measuring the waves, Talker relaying the messages to Engine and Wallace, Engine driving the ship nose first into the waves, and walls bracing to meet the shock. Talker forgot any fear he might have had in the swiftly functioning teamwork. He had no time to think. As the ship's communication system, he had to translate and flash his messages at top speed, coordinating information and directing action. In a matter of minutes, the storm was over. All right, Talker said. Let's see if there was any damage. His filaments had become tangled during the storm, but he untwisted and extended them through the ship, plugging everyone into circuit. Engine? I'm fine, Engine said. The tremendous old fellow had dampened his plates during the storm, easing down the atomic explosions in his stomach. No storm could catch an experienced spacer like Engine unaware. Walls? The walls reported one by one, and this took a long time. There were almost a thousand of them, thin, rectangular fellows making up the entire skin of the ship. Naturally, they had reinforced their edges during the storm, giving the whole ship resiliency, but one or two were dented badly. Doctor announced that he was all right. He removed Talker's filament from his head, taking himself out of circuit, and went to work on the dented walls. Made mostly of hands, Doctor had clung to an accumulator during the storm. Let's go a little faster now, Talker said, remembering that there still was the problem of determining where they were. He opened the circuit to the four accumulators. How are you? He asked. There was no answer. The accumulators were asleep. They had had their receptors open during the storm and were bloated on energy. Talker switched his filaments around them, but they didn't stir. Let me, Feeder said. Feeder had taken quite a beating before planting his suction cups to a wall, but his cockiness was intact. He was the only member of the crew who never needed doctor's attention. His body was quite capable of repairing itself. He scuttled across the floor on a dozen or so tentacles and booted the nearest accumulator. The big conical storage unit opened one eye, then closed it again. Feeder kicked him again, getting no response. He reached for the accumulator's safety valve and drained off some energy. Stop that, the accumulator said. Then wake up and report, Talker told him. The accumulators said testily that they were all right, as any fool could see. They had been accord to the floor during the storm. The rest of the inspection went quickly. Thinker was fine, and I was ecstatic over the beauty of the storm. There was only one casualty. Pusher was dead. By pedal, he didn't have the stability of the rest of the crew. The storm had caught him in the middle of a floor, thrown him against a stiffened wall, and broken several of his important bones. He was beyond doctor's skill to repair. They were silent for a while. It was always serious when a part of the ship died. The ship was a cooperative unit composed entirely of the crew. The loss of any member was a blow to all the rest. It was especially serious now. 
They had just delivered a cargo to a port several thousand light years from Galactic Center. There was no telling where they might be. I crawled to a wall and extended a seeing organ outside. The walls let it through, then sealed around it. I's organ pushed out far enough from the ship so he could view the entire sphere of stars. The picture traveled through Talker, who gave it to Thinker. Thinker lay in one corner of the room, a great shapeless blob of protoplasm. Within him were all the memories of his space-going ancestors. He considered the picture, compared it rapidly with others stored in his cells, and said, No galactic planets within reach. Talker automatically translated for everyone. It was what they had feared. I, with Thinker's help, calculated that they were off their course on the galactic periphery. Every crew member knew what that meant. Without a pusher to boost the ship to a multiple of the speed of light, they would never get home. The trip back, without a pusher, would take longer than most of their lifetimes. What would you suggest? Talker asked Thinker. This was too vague a question for the literal-minded Thinker. He asked to have it rephrased. What would be our best line of action? Talker asked. To get back to a galactic planet? Thinker needed several minutes to go through all the possibilities stored in his cells. In the meantime, Doctor had patched the walls and was asking to be given something to eat. In a little while, we'll all eat. Thinker said, twitching his tendrils nervously. Even though he was the second youngest crew member, only Feeder was younger. The responsibility was largely on him. This was still an emergency. He had to coordinate information and direct action. One of the walls suggested that they get good and drunk. This unrealistic solution was vetoed at once. It was typical of the walls' attitude, however. They were fine workers and good shipmates, but happy-go-lucky fellows at best. When they returned to their home planets, they would probably blow all their wages on a spree. Loss of ship's pusher cripples the ship for sustained faster than light speeds, Thinker began without preamble. The nearest galactic planet is 405 light years off. Talker translated this instantly along his wave packet body. Two courses of action are open. First, the ship can proceed to the nearest galactic planet under atomic power from engine. This will take approximately 200 years. Engine might still be alive at this time, although no one else will. Second, locate a primitive planet in this region upon which are latent pushers. Find one and train him. Have him push the ship back to galactic territory. Thinker was silent, having given all the possibilities he could find in the memories of his ancestors. They held a quick vote and decided upon Thinker's second alternative. There was no choice, really. It was the only one which offered them any hope of getting back to their homes. All right, Thinker said. Let's eat. I think we all deserve it. The body of the dead pusher was shoved into the mouth of Engine, who consumed it at once, breaking down the atoms to energy. Engine was the only member of the crew who lived on atomic energy. For the rest, Feeder dashed up and loaded himself from the nearest accumulator. Then he transformed the food within him into the substances each member ate. His body chemistry changed, altered, adapted, making the different foods for the crew. I lived entirely on a complex chlorophyll chain. Feeder reproduced this for him, then went over to give Talker his hydrocarbons and the walls their chlorine compound. For Doctor, he made a facsimile of a silicate fruit that grew on Doctor's native planet. Finally, feeding was over and the ship back in order. The accumulators were stacked in a corner, blissfully sleeping again. I was extending his vision as far as he could, shaping his main seeing organ for high-powered telescopic reception. Even in this emergency, I couldn't resist making verses. He announced that he was at work on a new narrative poem called Peripheral Glow. No one wanted to hear it, so I fed it to Thinker, who stored everything, good or bad, right or wrong. Engine never slept. Filled to the brim on Pusher, he shoved the ship along at several times the speed of light. The walls were arguing among themselves about who had been the drunkest during their last leave. Talker decided to make himself comfortable. He released his hold on the walls and swung in the air, his small round body suspended by his crisscrossed network of filaments. He thought briefly about Pusher. It was strange. Pusher had been everyone's friend and now he was forgotten. That wasn't because of indifference. It was because the ship was a unit. The loss of a member was regretted, but the important thing was for the unit to go on. The ship raced through the suns of the periphery. Thinker laid out a search spiral, calculating their odds on finding a pusher planet at roughly four to one. 
In a week, they found a planet of primitive walls. Dropping low, they could see the leathery, rectangular fellows basking in the sun, crawling over rocks, stretching themselves thin in order to float in the breeze. All the ship's walls heaved a sigh of nostalgia. It was just like home. These walls on the planet hadn't been contacted by a galactic team yet and were still unaware of their great destiny to join in the vast cooperation of the galaxy. There were plenty of dead worlds in the spiral and worlds too young to bear life. They found a planet of talkers. The talkers had extended their spidery communication lines across half a continent. Talker looked at them eagerly through eye. A wave of self-pity washed over him. He remembered home, his family, his friends. He thought of the tree he was planning to buy when he got back. For a moment, Talker wondered what he was doing here, part of a ship in a far corner of the galaxy. He shrugged off the mood. They were bound to find a pusher planet if they looked long enough. At least he hoped so. There was a long stretch of arid worlds as the ship pushed through the unexplored periphery. Then a planet full of primeval engines, swimming in a radioactive ocean. This is rich territory, Feeder said to Talker. Galactic should send a contact party here. They probably will, after we get back, Talker said. They were good friends, above and beyond the all-enveloping friendship of the crew. It wasn't only because they were the youngest crew members, although that had something to do with it. They both had the same kind of functions, and that made for a certain rapport. Talker translated languages. Feeder transformed foods. Also, they looked somewhat alike. Talker was a central core with radiating filaments. Feeder was a central core with radiating tentacles. Talker thought that Feeder was the next most aware being on the ship. He was never really able to understand how some of the others carried on the processes of consciousness. More suns, more planets. Engines started to overheat. Usually engine was used only for taking off and landing, and for fine maneuvering in a planetary group. Now he had been running continuously for weeks, both over and under the speed of light. The strain was telling on him. Feeder, with doctor's help, rigged a cooling system for him. It was crude, but it had to suffice. Feeder rearranged nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen atoms to make a coolant for the system. Doctor diagnosed a long rest for engine. He said that the gallant old fellow couldn't stand the strain for more than a week. The search continued, with the crew's spirits gradually dropping. They all realized that pushers were rather rare in the galaxy as compared to the fertile walls and engines. The walls were getting pockmarked from interstellar dust. They complained that they would need a full beauty treatment when they got home. Talker assured them that the company would pay for it. Even I was getting bloodshot from staring into space so continuously. They dipped over another planet. Its characteristics were flashed to Thinker, who mulled over them. Closer, and they could make out the forms. Pushers, pushers, pushers. They zoomed back into space to make plans. Feeder produced 23 different kinds of intoxicants for a celebration. The ship wasn't fit to function for three days. Everyone ready now? Talker asked, a bit fuzzily. He had a hangover that burned all along his nerve ends. What a drunk he had thrown. He had a vague recollection of embracing Engine, inviting him to share his tree when they got back home. He shuddered at the idea. The rest of the crew were pretty shaky too. The walls were letting air leak into space. They were just too wobbly to seal their edges properly. Doctor had passed out, but the worst off was Feeder. Since his system could adapt to any type of fuel except atomic, he had been sampling every batch he made, whether it was an unbalanced iodine, pure oxygen, or a supercharged ester. He was really miserable. His tentacles, usually a healthy aqua, were shot through with orange streaks. His system was working furiously, purging itself of everything, and Feeder was suffering the effects of the purge. The only sober ones were Thinker and Engine. Thinker didn't drink, which was unusual for a spacer, though typical of Thinker, and Engine couldn't. They listened while Thinker reeled off some astounding facts. From eyes pictures of the planet's surface, Thinker had detected the presence of metallic construction. He put forth the alarming suggestion that these pushers had constructed a mechanical civilization. That's impossible, the three of the walls said flatly, and most of the crew were inclined to agree with them. All the metal they had ever seen had been buried in the ground, 
or lying around in worthless oxidized chunks. Do you mean that they make things out of metal? Talker demanded. Out of just plain dead metal? What could they make? They couldn't make anything, Feeder said positively. It would break down constantly. I mean, metal doesn't know when it's weakening. But it seemed to be true. I magnified his pictures, and everyone could see that the pushers had made vast shelters, vehicles, and other articles from inanimate material. The reason for this was not readily apparent, but it wasn't a good sign. However, the really had part was over. The pusher planet had been found. All that remained was the relatively easy job of convincing a native pusher, which shouldn't be too hard. Talker knew that cooperation was the keystone of the galaxy, even among primitive peoples. The crew decided not to land in a populated region. Of course, there was no reason not to expect a friendly greeting, but it was the job of a contact team to get in touch with them as a race. All they wanted was an individual. Accordingly, they picked out a sparsely populated landmass drifting in while that side of the planet was dark. They were able to locate a solitary pusher almost at once. I adapted his vision to see in the dark, and they followed the pusher's movements. He lay down after a while beside a small fire. Thinker told them that this was a well-known resting habit of pushers. Just before dawn, the walls opened, and Feeder, Talker, and Doctor came out. Feeder dashed forward and tapped the creature on the shoulder. Talker followed with a communication tendril. The pusher opened his seeing organs, blinked them, and made a movement with his eating organ. The he leaped to his feet and started to run. The three crew members were astounded. The pusher hadn't even waited to find out what the three of them wanted. Talker extended a filament rapidly and caught the pusher 50 feet away by a limb. The pusher fell. Treat him gently, Feeder said. He might be startled by our appearance. He twitched his tendrils at the idea of a pusher, one of the strangest sights in the galaxy with his multiple organs, being startled at someone else's appearance. Feeder and doctors scurried to the fallen pusher, picked him up and carried him back to the ship. The walls sealed again. They released the pusher and prepared to talk. As soon as he was free, the pusher sprang to his limbs and ran at the place where the walls had sealed. He pounded against them frantically, his eating organ opening and vibrating. Stop that, the wall said. He bulged and the pusher tumbled to the floor. Instantly, he jumped up and started to run forward. Stop him, Talker said. He might hurt himself. One of the accumulators woke up enough to roll into the pusher's path. The pusher fell, got up again, and ran on. Talker had his filaments in the front of the ship also, and he caught the pusher in the bow. The pusher started to tear at his tendrils, and Talker let go hastily. Plug him into the communication system, Feeder shouted. Maybe we can reason with him. Talker advanced a filament toward the pusher's head, waving it in the universal sign of communication. But the pusher continued his amazing behavior, jumping out of the way. He had a piece of metal in his hand and he was waving it frantically. What do you think he's going to do with that? Feeder asked. The pusher started to attack the side of the ship, pounding at one of the walls. The wall stiffened instinctively and the metal snapped. Leave him alone, Talker said. Give him a chance to calm down. Talker consulted with Thinker, but they couldn't decide what to do about the pusher. He wouldn't accept communication. Every time Talker extended a filament, the pusher showed all the signs of violent panic. Temporarily, it was an impasse. Thinker vetoed the plan of finding another pusher on the planet. He considered this pusher's behavior typical. Nothing would be gained by approaching another. Also, a planet was supposed to be contacted only by a contact team. If they couldn't communicate with this pusher, they never would with another on the planet. I think I know what the trouble is, I said. He crawled up on an accumulator. These pushers have evolved a mechanical civilization. Consider for a minute how they went about it. They developed the use of their fingers, like doctor, to shape metal. They utilized their seeing organs, like myself, and probably countless other organs. He paused for effect. These pushers have become unspecialized. They argued over it for several hours. The walls maintained that no intelligent creature could be unspecialized. It was unknown in the galaxy, but the evidence was before them. The pusher cities, their vehicles, this pusher exemplifying the rest, 
seemed capable of a multitude of things. He was able to do everything except push. Thinker supplied a partial explanation. This is not a primitive planet. It is relatively old and should have been in the cooperation thousands of years ago. Since it was not, the pushers upon it were robbed of their birthright. Their ability, their specialty, was to push, but there was nothing to push. Naturally, they have developed a deviant culture. Exactly what this culture is, we can only guess. But on the basis of the evidence, there is reason to believe that these pushers are uncooperative. Thinker had a habit of uttering the most shattering statement in the quietest possible way. It is entirely possible, Thinker went on inexorably, that these pushers will have nothing to do with us, in which case our chances are approximately 283 to 1 against finding another pusher planet. We can't be sure he won't cooperate, Talker said, until we get him into communication. He found it almost impossible to believe that any intelligent creature would refuse to cooperate willingly. But how? Feeder asked. They decided upon a course of action. Doctor walked slowly up to the pusher who backed away from him. In the meantime, Talker extended a filament outside the ship, around and in again behind the pusher. The pusher backed against a wall, and Talker shoved the filament through the pusher's head into the communication socket in the center of his brain. The pusher collapsed. When he came to, Feeder and Doctor had to hold the pusher's limbs, or he would have ripped out the communication line. Talker exercised his skill in learning the pusher's language. It wasn't too hard. All pusher languages were of the same family, and this was no exception. Talker was able to catch enough surface thoughts to form a pattern. He tried to communicate with the pusher. The pusher was silent. I think he needs food, Feeder said. They remembered that it had been almost two days since they had taken the pusher on board. Feeder worked up some standard pusher food and offered it. My God, a steak, the pusher said. The crew cheered along Talker's communication circuits. The pusher had said his first words. Talker examined the words and searched his memory. He knew about 200 pusher languages and many more simple variations. He found that this pusher was speaking a cross of two pusher tongues. After the pusher had eaten, he looked around. Talker caught his thoughts and broadcast them to the crew. The pusher had a queer way of looking at the ship. He saw it as a riot of colors. The walls undulated. In front of him was something resembling a giant spider, colored black and green, with his web running all over the ship and into the heads of all the creatures. He saw I as a strange, naked little animal, something between a skinned rabbit and an egg yolk, whatever those things were. Talker was fascinated by the new perspective the pusher's mind gave him. He had never seen things that way before. But now that the pusher was pointing it out, I was a pretty funny-looking creature to settle down to communication. What in hell are you things? The pusher asked, much calmer now than he had been during the two days. Why did you grab me? Have I gone nuts? No, Talker said. You are not psychotic. We are a galactic trading ship. We were blown off our course by a storm and our pusher was killed. Well, what does that have to do with me? We would like you to join our crew, Talker said, to be our new pusher. The pusher thought it over after the situation was explained to him. Talker could catch the feeling of conflict in the pusher's thoughts. He hadn't decided whether to accept this as a real situation or not. Finally, the pusher decided that he wasn't crazy. Look, boys, he said, I don't know what you are or how this makes sense. I have to get out of here. I'm on a furlough, and if I don't get back soon, the U.S. Army's going to be very interested. Talker asked the pusher to give him more information about Army and he fed it to Thinker. These pushers engage in personal combat, was Thinker's conclusion. But why? Talker asked. Sadly, he admitted to himself that Thinker might have been right. The pusher didn't show many signs of willingness to cooperate. I'd like to help you lads out, pusher said, but I've got a war to fight. Besides, I don't know where you get the idea that I could push anything this size. You'd need a whole division of tanks just to budget. Do you approve of this war? Talker asked, getting a suggestion from Thinker. Nobody likes war, not those who have to do the dying, at least. Then why do you fight it? The pusher made a gesture with his eating organ, which I picked and sent to Thinker. It's kill or be killed. You guys know what war is, don't you? 
We don't have any wars, Itoshito, Talker said. You're lucky, the pusher said bitterly. We do. Plenty of them. Of course, Talker said. He had the full explanation from Thinker now. Would you like to end them? Of course I would. Then come with us, be our pusher. The pusher stood up and walked up to an accumulator. He sat down on it and doubled the ends of his upper limbs. How the hell can I stop all wars, the pusher demanded. I'm just Private Dave Martinson. Even if I went to the big shots and told them, you won't have to, Talker said. All you have to do is come with us. Push us to our base. Galactic will send a contact team to your planet. That will end your wars. The hell you say, the pusher replied. You boys are stranded here, huh? Good enough. No monsters are going to take over Earth. Bewilderedly, Talker tried to understand the reasoning. Had he said something wrong? Was it possible that the pusher didn't understand him? I thought you wanted to end wars, Talker said. Sure I do, but I don't want anyone making us stop. I'm no traitor. I'd rather fight. No one will make you stop. You will just stop because there will be no further need for fighting. Do you know why we're fighting? It's obvious. Yeah, what's your explanation? You pushers have been separated from the mainstream of the galaxy, Talker explained. You have your specialty, pushing, but nothing to push. Accordingly, you have no real jobs. You play with things, metal, inanimate objects, but find no real satisfaction. Robbed of your true vocation, you fight from sheer frustration. Once you find your place in the galactic cooperation, and I assure you that it is an important place, your fighting will stop. Why should you fight, which is an unnatural occupation, Shen you can push. Also, your mechanical civilization will end, since there will be no need for it. The pusher shook his head in what Talker guessed it was a gesture of confusion. What is this pushing? Talker told him as best he could. Since the job was out of his scope, he had only a general idea of what a pusher did. You mean to say that that is what every Earthman should be doing? Of course, Talker said. It is your great specialty. The pusher thought about it for several minutes. I think you want a physicist or a mentalist or something. I could never do anything like that. I'm a junior architect. And besides, well, it's difficult to explain. But Talker had already caught pusher's objection. He saw a pusher female in his thoughts. No, two, three. And he caught a feeling of loneliness, strangeness. The pusher was filled with doubts. He was afraid. When we reach Galactic, Talker said, hoping it was the right thing, you can meet other pushers, pusher females too. All you pushers look alike, so you should become friends with them. As far as loneliness in the ship goes, it just doesn't exist. You don't understand the cooperation yet. No one is lonely in the cooperation. The pusher was still considering the idea of there being other pushers. Talker couldn't understand why he was so startled at that. The galaxy was filled with pushers, feeders, talkers, and many other species, endlessly duplicated. I can't believe that anybody could end all war, Pusher said. How do I know you're not lying? I won't go. Talker felt as if he had been struck in the core. Thinker must have been right when he said these pushers would be uncooperative. Was this going to be the end of Talker's career? Were he and the rest of the crew going to spend the rest of their lives in space because of the stupidity of a bunch of pushers? Even thinking of this, Talker was able to feel sorry for the pusher. It must be terrible, he thought. Doubting, uncertain, never trusting anyone. If these pushers didn't find their place in the galaxy, they would exterminate themselves. Their place in the cooperation was long overdue. What can I do to convince you? Talker asked. In despair, he opened all the circuits to the pusher. He let the pusher see Engine's good-natured gruffness, the devil-may-care humor of the walls. He showed him eyes' poetic attempts and feeders' cocky good nature. He opened his own mind and showed the pusher a picture of his home planet, his family, the tree he was planning to buy when he got home. The pictures told the story of all of them, from different planets representing different ethics, united by a common bond, the galactic cooperation. The pusher watched it all in silence. After a while, he shook his head. The thought accompanying the gesture was uncertain, weak, but negative.
Talker told the walls to open. They did, and the pusher stared in amazement. You may leave, Talker said. Just remove the communication line and go. What will you do? We will look for another pusher planet. Where? Mars? Venus? We don't know. All we can do is hope there is another in this region. The pusher looked at the opening, then back at the crew. He hesitated and his face screwed up in a grimace of indecision. All that you showed me was true? No answer was necessary. All right, the pusher said suddenly. I'll go. I'm a damn fool, but I'll go. If this means what you say, it must mean what you say. Talker saw that the agony of the pusher's decision had forced him out of contact with reality. He believed that he was in a dream where decisions are easy and unimportant. There's just one little trouble, Pusher said with the lightness of hysteria. Boys, I'll be hanged if I know how to push. You said something about faster than light. I can't even run the mile in an hour. Of course you can push, Talker assured him, hoping he was right. He knew what a Pusher's abilities were. But this one... Just try it. Sure, Pusher agreed. I'll probably wake up out of this anyhow. They sealed the ship for takeoff while Pusher talked to himself. Funny, Pusher said. I thought a camping trip would be a nice way to spend a furlough, and all I do is get nightmares. Engine boosted the ship into the air. The walls were sealed, and I was guiding them away from the planet. We're in clear space now, Talker said. Listening to Pusher, he hoped his mind hadn't cracked. I and Thinker will give a direction. I'll transmit it to you, and you push along it. You're crazy, Pusher mumbled. You must have the wrong planet. I wish you nightmares would go away. You're in the cooperation now, Talker said desperately. There's the direction. Push. The Pusher didn't do anything for a moment. He was slowly emerging from his fantasy, realizing he wasn't in a dream after all. He felt the cooperation. I to Thinker. Thinker to talker, talker to pusher, all intercoordinated with walls and with each other. What is this? Pusher asked. He felt the oneness of the ship, the great warmth, the closeness achieved only in the cooperation. He pushed. Nothing happened. Try again, talker begged. Pusher searched his mind. He found a deep well of doubt and fear. Staring into it, he saw his own tortured face. Thinker illuminated it for him. Pushers had lived with this doubt and fear for centuries. Pushers had fought through fear, killed through doubt. That was where the pusher organ was. Martinson, specialist, pusher, entered fully into the crew, merged with them, threw mental arms around the shoulders of thinker and talker. Suddenly the ship shot forward at eight times the speed of light. It continued to accelerate. 